So no relevant disclosures for this talk. And my objective is to summarize the recent developments in peripheral tissue biomarkers for alpha synuclein in Parkinson's disease and other synucleinopathies. I'm gonna start with the brain as opposed to starting with peripheral tissue. So my key collaborator has been Dr. Thomas Beach. He is the neuropathologist who runs our uh, entire center and the entire brain and body donation program. And we have put together what's called the Unified Staging System for Lewy Body Disorders. We published this a number of years ago, and you can see the various stages here. Uh, stage one is olfactory bulb only, stage 2A, brainstem, 2B, limbic, three, both brainstem and limbic, and four is neocortical. And the reason I want to show you this, this slide in this uh, picture is the fact that to date, all of the work we have done with whole body autopsies, and I'll show you that in a second, uh, we've shown that we never see peripheral alpha-synuclein in any organ without involvement somewhere in the central nervous system. And it's clear that we can't biopsy the brain to look for synuclein, so we have to look for other sites. Now, the olfactory bulb is a very interesting potential target because we know that people with Parkinson's disease and other synucleinopathies lose their sense of smell, and that predates clinical Parkinsonism. And in one study of 102 autopsy cases that had brain alpha-synuclein, all of them had involvement of the olfactory bulb, and 14 of them had olfactory bulb only uh, synuclein. In our study, looking at 217 autopsy cases with central nervous system alpha-synuclein, you see here, 64 of 66 of the uh, Parkinson's disease cases had involvement of the olfactory bulb, and 27 of them were olfactory bulb only. This is a diagram of the olfactory bulb. You know that the cribriform plate sits here, so it would really be difficult to do biopsies. Tom has talked about doing them. We've talked to our neurosurgeons about doing them. Obviously, there are potential uh, side effects from doing that. And so this really is not the most feasible location to biopsy. So where in the periphery is synuclein located? So in the paper we did, as mentioned, looking at multi-organ distribution of phosphorylated alpha synuclein, and this was using immunohistochemistry, and using one slide from each of these regions, you can see all of the different sites that were looked at. Tom looked at 41 different sites in the periphery. We had done 92 whole body autopsies. You can see there were controls, incidental Lewy body disease, 17 PD cases, nine DLBs, 19 Alzheimer's disease cases that had Lewy bodies but did not have enough Lewy bodies um, to qualify as having DLB. And in no cases did we see peripheral alpha-synuclein without involvement of the central nervous system. When digging a little deeper, if you look at the frequency of alpha-synuclein in the 17 Parkinson's disease cases, you can see involvement of the spinal cord and you can see other uh, nervous system involvement. But the next highest, was the GI tract, and we found none in the skin. Of the 23 PD and DLB cases where Tom looked at multiple slides, 22 of the 23 had involvement, meaning alpha-synuclein um, pathology in the submandibular gland and in the lower esophagus. And in our study of the 11 PD and DLB cases where we had skin, none of them were positive. When you look a little bit more at the GI tract, you can see this is frequency of synuclein staining, and this is density of synuclein staining. Again, I, I would point out one slide per region, but we find a rostrocaudal gradient. So much more frequency and density in the rostral regions compared to the uh, distal regions or caudal regions of the GI tract. 
And Anderson's not the only group to find this. Gelpi published a very, very similar study uh, looking at whole body autopsies, abdominal ganglia were involved. You can see the GI tract, uh, the GU tract, and none of her cases uh, involved the, um, the skin. And I would note that they did not look at the submandibular gland in, in that study. So we took all of this data from the lab uh, and moved it into the clinic. And I'm going to show you our work and others looking at submandibular gland, the labial salivary glands, the colon, and the skin. So the first set of studies we did looked at the submandibular gland. And the submandibular gland, as you can see here, is fairly easy to biopsy. We used a needle core biopsy. First, we used an 18-gauge needle. Then we uh, went to a 16-gauge needle to try to improve uh, the amount of tissue that we obtained. We, did, we took two to six cores from each patient. This was done by one of, one of two of our near, ear, nose, and throat doctors. And in our studies, they used palpation. Other studies used ultrasound guidance to find the submandibular gland. This was an outpatient procedure using local anesthetic. In the first study that we published, we looked at 15 more advanced Parkinson's disease cases. And some people asked why we did that. And that was because of the autopsy study. So most of the autopsy uh, cases we look at have fairly advanced disease. So we want to, to prove the concept that we could biopsy patients with at least a five-year disease duration, and we had biopsied 15. In the second study, we biopsied 25 Parkinson's disease cases. All of them had disease duration of less than five years, and we also biopsied 10 controls. We did unilateral biopsies, immunohistochemistry for phosphorylated alpha-synuclein. And you see here the various different elements that you can see in the skin. And one of the most important issues is distinguishing positivity of nerve elements versus nonspecific bindings, such as at the edges of uh, muscle fibers. In the first study, again, of the advanced PD cases, 12 of the 15 cases had sufficient tissue. And this was an arbitrary determination that uh, Tom Beach made prior to the start of uh, looking at the tissue. But 12 of the, I'm sorry, 12 of the 15 had sufficient tissue. And of those 12, nine of the 12 were positive. So 75% sensitivity for detecting alpha-synuclein staining in the submandibular gland. In the second study, you can see 76% of the PD cases and 90% of the controls had sufficient tissue. Positivity rate, you'll see here, was 19 had sufficient tissue. I'm quoting 14 out of 18. And the reason is that one of the cases in the paper, we quoted it as 14 out of 19. But one of the cases eventually came to autopsy and actually had, a, had an uh, had MSA. And so the negative biopsy was not surprising because the patient actually did not have Parkinson's disease, they had MSA. So 78% positivity rate in the PD cases. And the specificity was not perfect as two of the nine controls also were positive. I would note, I followed up on one of those two controls, and that individual has never developed uh, Parkinson's disease or dementia with Lewy bodies. One of the controls I, I've lost to follow up. We were really happy when a second group went ahead and uh, did a similar study. And this was the uh, group led by uh, Vias and Alex Aranzo with Ellen Gelpi, uh, the pathologist. They used ultrasound guidance to do their biopsies. And what's interesting is despite using ultrasound guidance, they had less uh, success with getting sufficient tissue. But you can see their synuclein positivity rate was really quite similar. 67% in the PD cases, 89% in the RBDs, and they had no controls that were positive. I would note side effects. We saw swelling and bruising. 
and they saw some mild oral bleeding and some bruising as well. So pretty well tolerated. Finally, uh, the group led by uh, uh, Bi Jian and uh, Shin, they also did uh, biopsies using ultrasound and they had 100% tissue acquisition, which was great. But their alpha synuclein positivity was a little bit lower at 56% and none of their controls were positive. And you can see disease duration in their cases were two to seven years. Finally, doing a single biopsy might be good for uh, looking at diagnosis as was previously mentioned, but one of the other keys to biopsies is can it serve as a progression marker and can it serve as a biomarker for uh, inhibiting synuclein aggregation? So the only study that I'm aware of to date that has looked at longitudinal biopsies was a study that we published recently where we did longitudinal biopsies of our alpha synuclein positive PD cases. We did seven of those cases. The mean time between biopsies was about four years. In this case, we did bilateral biopsies. We tried to increase the amount of sufficient tissue, and we did that in the 12 of the 14 biopsy glands. Remember, seven patients, so 14 biopsies. 12 of them had sufficient tissue. All of them were positive, which is not surprising because they were all positive four years before. Um, but what was of great interest was the fact that there was one case that appeared to have a decrease in synuclein density. However, one was the same, and then the other four cases had an increase, especially these four cases, had a nice increase in density. So we think that this was uh, early data, pilot data to suggest that this may be a way of looking at progression. So to summarize on submandibular gland biopsies, tissue acquisition may be a problem. Bilateral biopsies improve that. There was good sensitivity and high specificity. We possibly could use it as a progression marker and it was pretty well tolerated. Now, if you feel your lower lip, you can see in this picture, in, this lower, in the lower lip are the labial salivary glands and there are little balls in there. And what we did was we did a small incision. It required two to three stitches to close it up. And you can get sufficient tissue in all the cases if you biopsy the labial, uh, the labial salivary gland. We did that because of Saracimo showed that two of three labial salivary glands were positive back in 2010. Follow-up studies though, very low positivity rates uh, in the Fulgus study. In our study, only one of the 15 was positive. And I would note that these are the same cases that we did submandibular gland biopsies. And you can see eight of the cases that were negative in the labial salivary gland were positive in the submandibular gland. And then Aronzo's group also did labial salivary glands, and you can see only 54% positivity in the PD cases, 50% in the RBD and the DLBs, and one of the 33 controls was positive. So not really the best place to biopsy. Now the colon, the colon received a tremendous amount of attention uh, over a number of years. The big issue with the colon is how do you get enough tissue, but more importantly, how do you get the depth of tissue to be able to study alpha-synuclein staining? Because a lot of the alpha-synuclein staining is in the submucosal plexus and the myenteric plexus and is somewhat dangerous to do those types of biopsies and is not something that uh, can necessarily be done easily. So to summarize some of the studies that have been done, um, in Parkinson's disease, you see that 21 out of 29 uh, via colonoscopy were positive, whereas none of the controls were positive. Shannon's group then found nine out of the nine of the PD cases were positive and none of the controls were positive using flexible sigmoidoscopy. 
And these, those two studies really generally generated a tremendous amount of interest in colon biopsies. It was um, a little deflating with Nansanji's group found that while the PD cases had a lot of positivity, all of their controls were positive. One of the exciting things about the colon biopsies is that many people, uh, certainly here in the US, but I think uh, elsewhere as well, get colon biopsies done uh, as part of routine colonoscopies for, uh, for screening for colon cancer. So when they looked at archive uh, biopsies, Shannon's group showed that three out of three of people with Parkinson's disease that had biopsies up to five years before being diagnosed were positive. Hilton's group then followed that up, showed that 11% of their PD cases were, pi up, bi were positive. And you can see only seven out of the 62 cases. Interestingly, two of those were seven, eight years before diagnosis, and none of the controls were positive. And the last study that I'm just going to show you here shows a, a positivity rate uh, in prodromal of about 50%, but in PD, only 48% in the overall GI tract, 60% in the colon, just three out of five, but also a lot of positivity in the controls. The last study was, uh, was one done by Sprenger and colleagues. You see here, they looked at both the mucosa and the submucosa. They found no positivity in the mucosa, and they found low amounts of positivity in the submucosa. So, my, uh, so the key summaries for the colon biopsies is there have been multiple different methods that have been used. The depth of the biopsies is, is definitely a problem, as I mentioned before. They're not as sensitive. And really, colon biopsies at this point are not the focus uh, of most of what is being done today. So the final area to talk about, and this is probably the most exciting area right now, is skin punch biopsies. You can see the technique that is used to biopsy the skin, and you can get multiple different layers, and you can get sufficient tissue in every case. There's no reason uh, we won't have, we'll have a problem with sufficient tissue. You can biopsy multiple sites, and I'll show you studies where they've done the cervical skin, uh, so up in the C7 region, abdominal skin, skin of the forearm, skin of the upper leg, and skin of the lower leg. The big issues is, uh, are the methods. What antibodies are being used? How do you prepare the tissue? How do you stain the tissue? How many, how many slides do you look at? And one of the most important issues is detecting uh, nerve elements versus nonspecific staining. The most data that's been published is uh, on the skin. And given time uh, restrictions, I'm going to try to summarize this and any, any skin data that I don't mention uh, it's just because of time. So the first study that was done was back in 2010. And one thing you'll notice between our autopsy studies and the studies that I started to show you with the biopsies is we're only a decade into this. I mean, it's very, very exciting work that is really early on. So the first study that came out unfortunately showed no positivity in the leg and two out of the 20 cases were positive when looking at chest. The next study by Wang was really exciting. 100% of the skin was positive in the PD case, but there was no specificity. All of the controls were positive. But as time has gone on and techniques have differed, that has changed. So Doppler's group found 52% positivity in the PDs and none of the controls. Donatio's group, you can see, had a rostrocaudal gradient, similar to what's been found in the GI tract, higher sensitivity up in the cervical skin region than the thigh and the leg, and excellent specificity. 
Doppler then showed with um, PD 67% positive, no controls were positive, and interestingly, some of the MSAs were positive. You can see further Zhang's group, um, Gibbons's group, 90% sensitivity, 9% or 91% specificity. Rodriguez Leva then published on this. And in this slide, the last one again is Donadio's group showing again a rostrocaudal gradient. 100% of the DLB cases were positive and none of the controls were positive. As mentioned, it also would be very, very important, if possible, to use biopsies uh, for prodromal Parkinsonism or prodromal DLB. And the best group, as you know, to study that is the RBD population. And you can see here some of the skin data looking at RBD showing 56% to 87% sensitivity. Again, 80% sensitivity in PD. And what was really nice to see again is perfect specificity. This was a study which was interesting by Antelmi's group because they used idiopathic RBD cases here, the 26 out of 30, and then RBD in patients who had narcolepsy, that was their control group and none of them were positive. Another exciting aspect of the uh, skin biopsy world is the ability to distinguish MSA from Parkinson's disease. And Donatio's group, again, all of this being immunohistochemistry, Donatio's group looked at Parkinson's disease with orthostatic hypotension versus MSA with Parkinsonism. <clears throat> again, remember these are clinical diagnoses. You can see here the PD group was positive in the somatosensory fibers of the subdermal plexus, whereas the MSA group was negative, and yet the MSA group was positive in autonomic fibers in the arterioles, the sweat glands, and the muscle erector pili. So potentially a way to distinguish between these two disorders. Donatio's group and um, Doppler's group, and you can see their uh, co-first authors, then wanted to show that didn't matter which lab did this, that there would be good inter-lab concordance. So they used uh, phosphorylated alpha-synuclein immunofluorescence. You can see here all the different cases that were looked at. They did C7 as well as the thigh and lower leg and really good intra-lab reproducibility. So 100% uh, in the German group, 96% at the Spanish group, and then, I'm sorry, the Italian group. And then you can see when they shared slides, they had 90% concordance, and that's really critical. The other area that uh, was published was looking at oligomers of alpha-synuclein, and it's unclear what the role of the oligomers were, uh, are pathologically, but I would just show you here that you can use the oligomers from forearm skin biopsies with 82% sensitivity and 86% specificity. To summarize for right now, the skin biopsies, there are multiple me methods, good sensitivity and excellent specificity. And I'll go back to the multiple methods. You remember that our group and uh, Gelpi's group had no positivities when we looked in skin and the autopsy data. And there certainly could be methodologic issues that have led to the differences in skin biopsy uh, positivity. You have sufficient tissue, multiple sites, and a rostrocaudal gradient, easy to perform. Skin biopsies can be done pretty much uh, universally. At our place, our nurses do the skin biopsies, minimal side effects. What's not available yet are longitudinal studies. It's my understanding they are underway, and it's likely going to be the best option to biopsy. This is an excellent summary by uh, Tsukita and colleagues uh, in Movement Disorders, published in 2019, showing um, all of the different locations, sensitivities, and specificities. So 
The labial salivary glands, again, poor sensitivity, good specificity. The GI tract, poor sensitivity, uh, pretty good specificity. The submandibular glands, better sensitivity, really good specificity. And the skin, also good sensitivity, excellent specificity. So I would refer you to that paper, um, which has all the data. Last but not least, I wanna to touch on seeding assays, which uh, very well may be the, the uh, technique that we use in the future. So what are seeding assays? Seeding assays, um, there are two types. They're called uh, real-time quaking-induced conversion, or RT-quick, and protein misfolding cyclic amplification, or PMCA. And these were originally used to detect prion proteins. And essentially, you uh, aliquot the tissue that you're interested. A lot of work has been done in Parkinson's cases with CSF. You add it to uh, monomers. You allow aggregation. You shake it and sonicate it, and then allow further aggregation. And you can see that the more uh, abnormal protein that is in the tissue that you study, the sooner you get the fluorescence signal. And so that's what's being used now for seeding assays. So the GI tract, there's one study looking at seeding assays, looking at GI biopsies in the antrum of the, uh, the stomach, the sigmoid colon or the rectum. You can see so-so um, sensitivity, 91% uh, specificity, and really, this is not much better than the uh, immunohistochemistry. The group that I'm working with, uh, we're working with a couple of groups, but Anamantha Kanthasamy, who is currently at Iowa State and is moving to the University of Georgia, he and his lab took a submandibular gland from our autopsy cases. And again, I would... Um, highlight the fact that autopsy cases are proven diagnoses where a lot of the work being done with biopsies are with clinical diagnosis only. And we know that clinical diagnosis is not 100% accurate. But we sent tissue from 13 Parkinson's disease cases, three incidental Lewy body disease cases, and 16 controls. And you can see there was 100% sensitivity for alpha-synuclein, so all the ILBD and PD cases were positive, and one of the 16 controls was positive, so 94% specificity, so clearly better than immunohistochemistry. We then sent tissue from the skin. Again, autopsied skin samples from uh, our program, and you can see here that sensitivity was outstanding. 21 of the 22 cases were positive, and sensitivity was really good as well, 95% uh, specificity. So skin RT quick could be a really, really exciting uh, technique. Now, we also sent skin at a similar time to Wen Quan Zhu's lab uh, at Cleveland. And his lab looked at skin from a number of different autopsy series. So not just our, our skin. You can see really, really good sensitivity for Parkinson's disease, so 94%, 100% for DLB, two or three MSAs, pretty good for the Alzheimer's disease specificity. And I would note, uh, that some could potentially uh, have Lewy bodies if it wasn't from our, uh, our tissue. You can see good specificity from CBD and PSP and very good specificity when compared to controls. In the same paper, they also received skin biopsies from a number of different sites. They had uh, skin biopsies from C7 and two leg sites. They used RT quick. You can see 95% sensitivity and 100% specificity. And I would note the rostrocaudal gradient in that two of the PD cases who were positive in the cervical uh, skin were negative in the leg. 
The most recent paper that came out from Donatio's group, but again, the lab used uh, was Wen Quan Zhu's uh, lab. They compared immunofluorescence with RT-QIP. They did 31 different synucleinopathies. You can see 17 Parkinson's, five DLB, eight probable MSAs, and three um, um, autonomic failure cases. They also looked at 38 non-synucleinopathy cases, and you can see one of the concerns I have is that the disease duration was very short. So um, disease duration in all these cases means that the clinical diagnostic accuracy may not be as good in more, as more advanced cases. They also looked at 24 controls, some with other neurologic disorders and some non-neurologic. What's interesting is sensitivity, immunofluorescence was 90%, RT-QUIC 86%, and again, this was of the skin. They also looked at CSF from some of these cases, and the sensitivity was a little bit less in CSF than in skin. Specificity, you can see here, 100% for immunofluorescence and only 80% for RT-QUIC in the skin, 100% in the CSF. And you can see the diagram there. So to conclude, where should we biopsy? Well, it's pretty clear that the skin is an easier location to biopsy. It's going to be less expensive. There are less side effects, and you're guaranteed enough tissue. I think it's going to be uh, very important to standardize those methods. How is the processing going to be easily available? That's going to be important, and it needs to be not too expensive. And I constantly uh, repeat myself by saying, do not rule out the submandibular gland, because currently there's no data in the skin about progression. And since, at least in the autopsy material, the density of alpha-synuclein in the skin is so much greater than it is in the in these, I mean, the density in the submandibular gland is so much greater than in the skin, uh, it might be a better progression marker. Possible uses, confirmed diagnosis. I'm not sure that really changes our clinical uh, treatment of our patients right now. So I would not recommend that, that these biopsies be used right this minute for, for confirming diagnosis, and we can discuss that during the Q&A. For sure, it could be used for clinical trial enrollment, especially for early and possibly prodromal cases, and might be beneficial prior to any invasive treatments. It could be potentially used as a research gold standard. So right now, most biomarker studies, genetic studies, epidemiologic studies, don't have autopsy confirmation of the disease. And this might be a way of actually using a gold standard to prove these cases have the alpha-synuclein uh, positivity. Longitudinal biopsies, as I mentioned, if it increases over time, it might be used to monitor disease progression and hopefully would be used to determine the effects of anti-alpha-synuclein aggregation treatment. Could it replace imaging? So many people are using DAT scans and imaging. I per personally don't use that most of the time. But could this replace imaging? It might, if, we had a le if it's less expensive. It would need to compare sensitivity and specificity. Imaging, we know, is a poor progression marker. But if it, we eventually had alpha-synuclein imaging, I think that would be much better than uh, anything we have today. And seeding assays, it's really important to realize, could be more sensitive, more uh, specific, and might be more widely available since it doesn't require somebody to actually look at the slide, but rather is uh, a technique that's, that's done by the lab. I have highlighted a lot of the work from my group. I definitely want to point out Dr. Tom Beach, as I mentioned, who really is the person who oversees everything. I run the clinical part. He runs uh, the whole brain and body donation program. And I very much would like to refer you to our website, which is brainandbodydonationprogram.org, 
If you have any interest in doing tissue studies on Parkinson's disease, incidental Lewy body disease, dementia with Lewy bodies, Alzheimer's disease cases with Lewy bodies, we have the tissue and would love to, uh, to share that. And last, I'll just mention, uh, we look forward, I'm the secretary-elect for the Movement Disorder Society, and we hope that uh, you'll be interested in attending the virtual Congress in uh, 2021. So with that, uh, I thank you for your attention and really appreciate again the uh, invitation to, to speak with you today.